Because you already know about competition from episode 26 and monopoly from episode 27, you actually have all the information you need to analyze a monopolistically competitive market. As the name of this structure suggests, it's something of a mashup of the characteristics of a perfectly competitive market and those of a monopoly market. It's competitive, so like perfect competition, there are a large number of sellers, a large enough number so that no individual can affect the overall market. And as the large number of competitors would suggest, there's free entry and exit. Firms find no substantial barriers to entering or departing this market. But moving in the direction of a monopoly, the monopolistic competitor's product is differentiated, albeit only slightly, from the products produced by its rivals. This product differentiation gives the monopolistically competitive firm a small amount of control over the price that it can charge. Not a lot of control, because the products are still highly similar, but a little control. Think back to the toothbrush example from episode 25. Toothbrushes are toothbrushes with small differences like angled heads or rubber grip handles or the ability to play a song to tell you how long to brush your teeth. If I, as the customer, believe that the rubber grip handle is the key to good dental health, then the rubber grip handle toothbrush manufacturer will be able to get me to pay a bit more for the product than for any other kind of toothbrush. Not too much more though, or I'll switch to a closed substitute. Notice that in my toothbrush example, there's a real differentiation where there are physical differences in the products. It is possible in this market structure to have artificial differentiation where two products are physically identical but through marketing, say attractive packaging or celebrity endorsements, consumers are convinced that the products are different. This couldn't happen in a perfectly competitive market because of the assumption of perfect information being available. But in a monopolistically competitive market, perfect information does not exist, and consumers can be fooled into believing that products are different by the use of advertising and marketing. In the end, as long as consumers perceive the products to be different, then the products are different. It doesn't matter whether the difference is real or artificial. So, in monopolistic competition, there are lots of competitors with highly substitutable products that have slight differences, and there's free entry and exit. What does the market look like? Well, the demand facing each producer will be a small fraction of the overall market demand, and the demand will be highly, but not perfectly, elastic. So, whereas the perfectly competitive firm's demand was horizontal, showing that they had no control over price, the monopolistically competitive firm's demand will be downward sloping, if fairly flat, showing that the firm has a small amount of control over its price. From here, you can treat the graph much as you treated the monopoly graph. With a downward sloping demand, the firm's marginal revenue will lie below its demand curve. To find the profit maximizing output and price for the firm, we need to add the marginal cost curve, determine where marginal revenue equals marginal cost to get the optimal output Q star, and then use the demand line to determine how much the firm owner can get the buyers to pay for those Q star units. Like a monopolist, a monopolistically competitive firm could make money, lose money, or break even in the short run. But like perfect competition, the picture will change in the long run. The firm will end up just breaking even over time. Why? Because not only does the firm have very little market power, remember also the assumption of free entry and exit. If a monopolistically competitive firm is making a profit in the short run, then other firms will see that profit and they will enter the industry. This will draw away some customers from the existing firm, lowering demand, and eventually, the existing firm will just break even. Remember, if profits still exist, new firms continue to enter until there are no more profits to be had. What if the firm is losing money in the short run? In the long run, then, some firms will leave. Their customers will have to shift to other sellers so that the remaining firms will see their demand curves increase until such point as they can break even. At that point, exit from the industry stops. So in the long run, like a perfectly competitive firm, the profits are driven to zero. There is an important difference, though. Take a look at the two types of firms. The perfectly competitive firm in the long run always ends up operating at the most efficient point, that is, the lowest per unit cost, on the long run average total cost curve, whereas the monopolistically competitive firm always operates just shy of peak efficiency, operating at a slightly higher cost and producing fewer units. 
To wrap up, let's do a quick recap of this market structure as compared to perfect competition and monopoly. There are a large number of firms, more like perfect competition. With respect to the product produced, it's not identical across firms as with perfect competition, but neither is it unique. The products are differentiated but highly similar and therefore highly substitutable. Entry and exit are easy, which affects the ability to sustain profits. All types of firms use the marginal revenue equals marginal cost rule to maximize profit, and any firm could make money, lose money, or break even in the short run. But in the long run, only a firm with barriers to entry to protect its profits can sustain those profits. What about price and output? The result will be somewhere between the two extreme structures. Producing more than a monopoly, but less than a perfectly competitive market, charging less than a monopoly, but more than a perfectly competitive market. Next time, oligopoly.